dozens of papers, um, um, or I should say many more than dozens <laughs> of papers that have been extremely influential in all these different fields. Um, and uh, cited over uh, 19,000 times. I think that's what uh, I just checked. Um, he has also been, uh, and I, I would say this is probably what most of you know, uh, extremely influential in the uh, uh, foundation of uh, the field of neuroeconomics. Um, he has contributed uh, by um, uh, authoring and editing uh, arguably the, the main textbooks on this, uh, on this new field. And so um, it, I, I'm delighted to um, just, uh, introduce him. And, um, he's going to be talking about the economic model of choice uh, from as if to because. Thank you, uh, This is not the title that was in the program. The title that was in the program is a paper I'm working on and most excited about right now was going to give a kind of more traditional economics talk. And so he said, don't do that. You will be really tired. At the end of the day, uh, you should give a philosophy talk. And he's going to give an overview of neuroeconomics, and then maybe focus in on some new developments that you think are important. So my talk kind of goes in three pieces. First, I want to kind of explain what the philosophy behind neuroeconomics is, which I think we don't talk about enough. Then I want to make clear how much has been accomplished in the last decade. I want to talk about the representation of subjective value in the brain, why it matters, and what it means for multiple self theories, what it means for a lot of day-to-day -day economics that we do. Maybe impacts that won't be felt for another 10 years, but I think are very important. And then in the last day, I'll talk about a series of representational theorems that my group has been working on over the course of the last 10 years, which I think have more important impacts down the road the general theory of choice. So, okay, so let me start here um, with everyone's favorite father of modern economics, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, I think, defined modern economics, or at least in the neoclassical school. Um, and he said that a good theory should be simple. That's really a great idea. The theory should be super compact. It should be fruitful, by which Friedman meant it should make positive predictions either about welfare or about behavior. But he said two other things that are really interesting. He said a theory should not have to be complete. We're not trying to understand everything. We're just trying to understand little things. And it should not be realistic. I don't care, he said, if your theory requires firms to compute very, very complex integrals that you don't think undergraduates can compute. He was really focused on that problem. He had seven. So don't worry about realism. And to drive this point home, this famous 1953 book, he tells this story, which to a biologist is astonishingly bizarre. <laughs> he says, neoclassical economics is similar to the hypothesis that leaves on a tree are positioned by the tree as if each leaf seeks to maximize the amount of sunlight it receives. Now a biologist is like, what else is the tree trying to do? <laughs> Given the position of its neighbors, as if it knew the physical laws determining the amount of sunlight that could be received in various positions and could move rapidly and instantaneously about it. Is the hypothesis rendered unacceptable or invalid because, as far as we know, trees do not do this? This is a really weird statement because, in fact, of course, we know this is exactly what trees do. Um, it would be interesting to understand the mechanism by which trees and how they achieve this optimal behavior. But Friedman says, I don't care about that, and it's not even relevant, and probably they don't really do it, just kind of looks that way. Okay, so that's a great story, and it motivated, I think, a generation of economists. But it's a story that really, uh, a group of us starting work about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, really wanted to challenge. See, we had this idea that the as-if doctrine, which says a theory should be simple and fruitful, it doesn't have to have all these features about being locked in the reality of the world. But that was really compromising the power of economics. It meant that you could only do economics at the econometric level 
In the, very, in the beginning, we couldn't even do experimental economics. <coughs> well, we can do economics by asking how do people actually make decisions. We can do economics by asking what are the psychological foundations of economics. Because all those things are kind of irrelevant. There's no coupling between different levels. Now, we began pointing out about 25 years ago that um, there are other sciences that have faced the problem of asking to different levels of analysis couple. Just like we can ask, is economics coupled to psychology and psychology coupled to biology? Chemists and physicists ask questions about coupling. Chemists and biologists ask questions about coupling. And those questions which were asked over the course of the first half of the 20th century all came to one really clear answer. If you included the constraints of chemistry into biology, biology got more powerful. This is just pure goods or effect. When Watson and Crick first discovered DNA, there was a movement in the Harvard Biology Department not to give tenure to Watson. Because they said, it's not biology. And it will have no impact on modern biology. It's purely chemistry. OK, so that's 1940s. That's not true anymore. You could not find a biology department that did not include the study of DNA. Now, there's been this history of, you want me to stop with the microphone? <laughs> okay, you want me to take this off? Yes. Sorry. Okay. 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 Does this work? I can, no one can hear me though, except the people I'm screaming at. Okay, it's a trade-off. I'm going to speak really loud. <laughs> The two people who are watching the screen. <laughs> uh, okay. This is not well, a maximization problem. It's a streaming maximization problem. Well, you can use both. Okay, now it's going to get really good. Okay, okay. so, so um, I'm just, just jumping ahead. ahead. So, <coughs> there's a long history of the sciences with this idea that when we incorporate reality into our models, like that means looking down at lower levels of analysis, we gain power in the model. Every discipline says that's not true until it does it. And every discipline that has ever been forced to do it has become more powerful. Every discipline says that if we do this, a couple of lower disciplines, we will all lose our jobs, and, we will, and the world will be taken over by physicists, and that also never happens. So I think these are institutional constraints and inertia, and it's really been a focus of neuroeconomists to, to abandon this notion of as if, and actually ask a very simple question. If we believe that at the level of economics, there is some as-if object called utility, why don't we have the strength of our convictions and say people don't behave as if there is an underlying utility representation nowhere, but instead they behave because there actually is something like an underlying utility representation somewhere in the brain and that if we understand that representation, it will explain choice behavior. And so the work of a number of the neuroeconomists today has been an effort to kind of align notions from economics with notions of psychology. That's really at the core of uh, behavioral economics. And more recently, to align notions uh, like choice with notions in neuroscience. And to try and really understand how constraints percolate up and down these different Oh, I see. That's the problem. It's this thing, which is my problem. Okay. So I'm going back to Friedman's parable of the tree for a second. You know, the truth is that what trees actually do, which we totally understand, is that they have a compound called auxin in their cells. And when sunlight hits it, it is uh, damaged. Auxin controls the rate of growth. And the result is that growth is fastest when there is shadow. And this causes branches and leaves and trees to turn towards the sun and maximize, in a very simple way, that's non-strategic, the amount of sunlight that they get. We don't have to say it's as if leaves are turning their selves to maximize sunlight. We could say, as you know, botanists, we could say, oh, our hypothesis is that plants do this because they have some mechanism for computing 
the integral of sunlight falling on their surfaces. And then we could search for it. And when we found it, we'd be really happy because it would tell us something about our theory being more true, and it might modify our underlying theory. And it might allow us to compare different theories. OK, so with that idea, let's zoom to an imaginary time before the behavioral revolution and imagine there was a neuroeconomist there. So this would be like me at age one. <laughs> and at that time, we pretty much believed in expected utility theory, uh, probably a little before I was one, but whatever, around then. And the hypothesis, the because version of uh, expected utility theory would be simply that somewhere in the brain lies the expected utility representation. And this is driven out of some representation of delay and some representation of value or preferences and some representation of probability. That's an extremely simple theory, and it would be really cool to go look for that in the brain if you were Milton Friedman, I think. Of course, the problem that happened was that we discovered that EU wasn't a particularly good model for human behavior. Everybody okay with that? And so that makes it a bad fundamental theory for neuroeconomics. So a reasonable question is what would replace it? And this is really something that happened at the very beginning of the neuroeconomic revolution. You know, we had this renaissance of the multiple selves theories, which are still very much with us at a psychological and an economics level. These have their origin in the work, of course, of Plato, who talked about the charioteer with the rational and emotional horses that are being, the rational charioteer and the emotional horses and blah, blah, blah. And really takes its common form from something that Danny Kahneman has said quite a lot, the notion that we are always made up of multiple selves, always at least two. These multiple selves have different goals or preferences or structures. And Danny's often quite explicit about the idea that what he really means is that there are two parts of our brain. This is a clear because statement that I stole from Danny. Um, and that these two parts of our brain, one is kind of a rabbit who only cares about stuff right now, who's very uh, present biased, and a turtle who's very rational. I don't know why turtles are rational. They're actually evolutionarily more primitive than rabbits, but whatever. <laughs> and of course, the, um, the parable of multiple selves really had its first very big impact. Now, I mean, it had a big impact on me. You know, Dave Labson and I were postdocs at the same, or graduate students at the same time. We've known each other for 30 years. And when Dave presented the Beta Delta model the very first time, it was seen as an instantiation of this parable, and I believed it, that there would be two selves inside the brain. This is the Beta Delta discounting model. It's, this is the beta term, right? Everybody knows this, which is the present bias term. And this is the nice exponential discounter. That's really cool. And David, very early on, posited, as did I, said, look, this, this is a because model. We ought to be able to go into the brain and find the beta element and find the delta element. And they ought to be driving choice in a way we can understand. And I think this was the first really uh, visible neuroeconomic paper. It wasn't the first. It was 10 years into the project. But it was the first one that really bit off a serious economic problem. It was done, I mean, in fairness to, it was innovative, but it was done very quickly. And in this original experiment, oh, this is just what I said. Here's uh, David's happy rabbit uh, being beta and the turtle being delta. And so these guys did a series of experiments that were published in Science Magazine in 2004. They were super visible. This was really meant as a because experiment. But the experiment had been done very, very quickly to get it out into the cover of science. And so it hadn't actually looked specifically for a beta and a delta econometric signature. What it had done is it had looked for a series of brain areas that preferred immediate rewards that were more active when they viewed immediate rewards than when they viewed delayed rewards. Let me remind you that every theory of discounting predicts that immediate rewards have more value than delayed rewards. So all possible value representations would be captured by this model. But because they came in with this prior, which is that beta does all the interesting work in present bias choice, they said any place that prefers an immediate reward to a delay reward, we're going to call that the rabbit. Then they couldn't find anything that matched the exponential discount curve. They looked for it. 
So instead they said, any choice that takes a very long time, that must be about deliberation. And so that must be the signature of the turtle. So I published this paper in Science. At the same time, my research group was working on this problem with, with a much more econometric sort of foundation and did very, very traditional, really detailed discount experiments like the ones Springer and Andreoni would do. And I, I won't go into really any detail about this, but they were all incentive compatible. They looked straight out of a really righteous behavioral econ lab. And the reason we did it was because it allowed us to compute discount functions for every individual in our study. So here I'm showing you, um, these are actually hyperbolic fits. We did exponential fits, we did beta delta fits. Uh, just to give you a sense of what it was like, these are at six delays. And so here at the top is a subject who's a very shallow discounter. Here at the bottom is a subject who's a very, very steep discounter. And this is work that I did at the time with Joe Cable, then a postdoc of mine, now a chaired, prof uh, yeah, chaired professor at University of Pennsylvania. So here's the simple idea. We're going to go look in the brain. We've got all the models. We've got detailed econometric fits. And we're going to say, can we find some place where the beta model lives, some place where the delta model lives, or some place where their combination lives, and how does all of that work? And I mean, to our surprise, um, we could find nowhere in the brain that represented the beta model better than it represented the total discount function of the subject. And we could find nowhere in the brain that represented the delta function better than it represented the total discount function of the subject. So we published an influential paper in which we argued these are, um, su these are subjects that's probably too boring in neuroscience-y, but um, these little orange spots are the places where the, what you might call the subjective value function is represented. Now I'm getting away from calling this a discounted utility function because I don't want to invoke all the welfare assumptions there, and I'm not going to invoke some of the other assumptions about limits on cardinality. We try and never to use dis, uh, utility to talk about this thing in the brain. I always refer to it as subjective value or discounted subjective value. Where does discounted subjective value live in the brain? It lives in two places. It lives in the uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex. <coughs> it's this area right here. And it lives in the ventral striatum. It's this little area right here. Every, basically every human who's ever been checked chose this. And it shows it regardless of whether you're a steep discounter like this crazy guy who discounts at 1,200% uh, or this person who discounts at 10%. These are universal features of humans and they have now been validated in dozens and dozens of studies. Okay. Oh, this is an ex another example of this. This is work done in animals, uh, also by my lab. This is with a then postdoc of mine, Ken Y. Louie. Details are not super important. This is a kind of cool fact. You can do this in humans too. In black is the behaviorally derived discount function for each of two monkeys. And in red is the neurobiologically derived discount function for those same monkeys. I mean, they're, they're more accurate than the error bars would lead you to expect them to be. And these are consistently true. There is a single representation in the brain of discounted subjective value. We know where it lives. It is the analog of utility, but it does not obey traditional rational choice. It just doesn't. That sucks, but it's just true. Beta delta is great because it says that there's a rational turtle in your brain and an irrational rabbit, and if we ignore the rabbit, we can at least harvest all the value of consistency. This says that that just doesn't exist. And there are dozens and dozens of papers, which I know economists don't generally read, that say this. There is no controversy about this within the neuroeconomic community or amongst neuroscientists. Okay, so I'm going to raise a different possibility. The revised fundamental theorem of choice becomes somewhere in the brain lives the utility analog. It causally produces choice. I'm going to defer for a moment how it's computed and how it's derived from its inputs and just say our theory now is that that lives there and that the rabbit and the um, turtle story are just, is just wrong. So, Tons of labs have asked this question. Paul, that's crazy. I can show you the rabbit and the turtle. One of the most famous ways that that was attempted was to try and show that loss aversion represented two systems, one associated with losses and one associated with gains, or one specific to loss aversion. 
Veronica Tom did this with Russ Poldrack and Craig Fox, who some of you know. And they did a really, really beautiful econometric study, essentially where they did a bilinear fit, a utility function with a kink. And they asked, where in the brain is the positive above the reference point utility function live? Where does the below the utility function, below the kink utility function live? These are where the linear below, linear above utility. And the interesting thing is there is no place in the brain where they're separable. And this has now been done by a ton of labs. And they concluded, oh, this is predicting loss aversion behaviorally from loss aversion neurally across a group of subjects. You see how good the fit is. There's no tortoise and there's no hair for this thing in the brain. Now, let, let me pause and say, I'm not saying these are bad models for um, us to use as economists. And I sometimes use them in my behavioral studies. But when I'm being a because economist, I'm, I'm mindful that at the end of the day, these models are wrong. And that we have to find models that are right someday. Here's another example, risk and ambiguity. I won't belabor this. This is Jafat Zalibi's work. Um, she's now a full professor at Yale University. Uh, we did this with Aldo Restichini. Same story, gosh, ambiguity aversion. That's certainly going to be weird, maybe an uncertainty. There'll be something special there. There isn't. It's the same place. It's the same story. There's no rabbit. There's no turtle. Don't believe me. <laughs> there is now a meta-study. There are now three meta-studies that have been done on this. This is kind of my favorite. Um, it is by Joe Cable's group. And um, it was done in 2013. That's a long time ago. There's one from 2017. It had 206 neuroeconomic or near neuroeconomic studies looking for evidence of multiple selves. No evidence found. So, I mean, I know this is kind of weird because, at least it's looking at me, that can't be true because I hear Dave Labson say that this is not true all the time. And we often see, I feel bad saying this, but you know, Sylvia dared me, so. Lots of times I see, here's a, okay, here's a great story. It's old enough that it won't be embarrassing. I'm sitting at AEA. It is 2006 or seven. There are gonna be two talks, back to back, George Lowenstein and uh, Dave Labeston. And they're gonna talk about multiple selves. And David gets up and he gives this beautiful talk and he points at a bunch of brain areas and he says, as you can see, here's the impulsive self and here is the patient self. And someone says, some, someone says, what are those brain areas? And he says, well, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is the impulsive self and the ventral striatum is the patient self. And George gets up, he says, Labson's absolutely right, exactly right, exactly right, tells the same story, shows the same two brain areas, but gives them the opposite labels. The econometrics give him the exactly opposite result. Nobody, there's this word silence, I'm standing there. And of course, but I'm not someone who asks questions a lot, so Antonio Ranhal gets up, because he can never resist asking questions. He says, I believe the two of you just produced completely, completely opposite papers. And they said, no, we produced exactly the same paper. He said, yeah, but your, your attribution to these objects, they're not just colored blobs. There's a theory here. And you're saying, one of you is saying this is the turtle, and one of you are saying this is the rabbit. Which is it? And George was so cross, and he was just like, that's not the point. That, that is the point. And it's so easy to obscure the reality when speaking with an economist who doesn't do this for a living by quickly changing the names of these five word brain areas and shuffling them around. When someone says to you, the turtle lives in the frontal cortex, uh, the parietal cortex, uh, the ventral striatum, uh, the amygdala. No, wait, that's the rabbit. No, that's the turtle. So that's frustrating to me because, I mean, this is not a black art. This is just econometrics. But nobody does it, takes the time to show you this, their theory lay out the uh, biological model, to do the econometrics to the point at which it's proven. And the result is we have a lot of papers, early papers, which are still impactful, 
that have been clearly disproven for which there are multiple papers showing the econometric error in the analysis and everybody just says, well, there are two views here, I guess. Well, if you read the paper, there aren't two views, but I get it, people don't read papers, but I don't know, I'm old enough, not, whatever, sorry. Okay. So this is the fundamental theorem of neuroeconomics, as I see it. And um, I, I just want to pause and say this is, this is a truly amazing thing. I mean, I dreamed of this when I started doing this. Is there a utility analog in the brain? The answer is, it is beyond a doubt that we know where utilities analog lives in the brain. We can use it to predict behavior. You can scan someone and determine their preferences. We can use it to determine stochasticity. This has all been done. And I think there's just not enough appreciation of the fact that there are now hundreds of papers that establish this fact. There are technical limitations. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's expensive. It's not wise to imagine we'll use it for policy, but it could be very useful for understanding underlying models and for asking if you're willing to ask kind of the because questions. Okay, so this gets me to the next obvious question. So I, I said, there's a lot of apparently irrational behavior, right? The entire architecture of behavioral economics is correctly built on the observation that our traditional notions of rationality seem to break down. And so there are two possible explanations for why it is that this function, you know, it is, I mean, I'm a mathematician too, I, that this is a hyperbolic discount function is, is horrible. Right? I wake up in the middle of the night like everyone else, but I just don't want to close my eyes to that fact. Okay, so why is the brain doing this stuff? And there are two theories out there. One theory is because animals and brains are dumb. They're just bad devices. We are crappy machines. Now, this, this story takes a couple of different paths. One path I sometimes hear is, it's like I'll say to someone like Danny Kahneman, I'll say, Danny, but like we know that moose foraging for grasses on the plains of Canada make near optimal intersection of constraint solutions to their foraging problem. And Danny would say, well, that's because humans are really tangled up. Humans are kind of uniquely bad choosers, maybe because their environments are so complicated. So one version of this goes, um, evolution and our brains are dumb, but no, no other animals have this problem. And another version of this goes, all other animals are dumb. We may be a little less dumb than them, but all animals are dumb. This is an even, I think, darker view of evolution because it suggests that over three billion years of competitive interactions, there is no significant progress towards the efficient frontier. If that is true, forget policy economics. Okay, so what I think is that there's a second option. I'm gonna to talk to you about it now. And that is that the reason a lot of the behaviors we observe are puzzling is because we have not yet figured out what are the constraints that the brain is operating under? And is it possible that we missed something when we wrote expected utility theory down as a community? And it, or I mean, you can pick any, you, you can pick rank dependent utility, any of these cool models that are beautiful and Friedman love and I love, um, what's wrong with them? Okay. Here's my hypothesis, and now this is what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna talk about a series of papers that we've published over the last five years, and I'm not gonna talk about our representational theorems which grow out of these. When von Neumann and Morgenstern wrote down expected utility theory, you will notice that it never mentions the cost of the representation. Let's think about that for a moment. Which would you rather have A, which is worth 1.0000001 euros, or B, which is worth only one euro. Traditional EU says 100% perfect choice, you pick A. It doesn't matter that it differs only in the seventh decimal place. Everybody okay with that? And the idea is, in traditional EU, that precision is just not an issue. It's a deterministic mechanism. Okay. 
let's think about the brain for a moment. The brain is a physical object. It consumes um, about 20% of the food that you eat. The rest of your body, which accounts for 95% of your body weight, gets only 80% of your food. We know that precision scales roughly monotonically with number of brain cells. That's kind of cool. So we could ask, as an exercise, what would it cost to increase precision by one order of magnitude? The answer is, it would increase your metabolic daily demand by 300%. Everybody okay with that? We would carry around a head, a brain that weighed 50 pounds, or uh, 20 kilos, as against our current brains, which weigh about 2 kilos. So we'd look like those Star Trek guys. Um, you'd have to eat three times as much. Everybody okay with that? And you'd only have achieved one order of magnitude more precision. What if I asked you, uh, was that a good, efficient, economical decision? I'm going to go out and forage. I'll really be able to nail choices between uh, Kit Kat and, uh, and, I don't know, and some other candy bar. That might be a hard choice. They have almost the exact same utility. And by carrying around all that extra weight and eating three times as much, I will never produce preference reversals around candy bars of almost identical value. Okay, so that just obviously does not make any sense. So here's a very simple idea. There is a hidden cost function. This is very popular in behavioral economics today. And I mean, that's where I get this inspiration. And the cost function is on precision. Let me say this one other way. Let's imagine that this is uh, the support for a set of prizes, where on the horizontal axis is, yeah, for, I could make this uh, x, or I could make it u of x where there's a mean value for the support, and it's got some Gaussian distribution. And you know it, because I told it to you before the problem begins. But your encoding system is going to allow you to represent that imperfectly. This is just random utility theory. You're going to add an epsilon to it. In the simplest possible case, this is traditional McFadden utility, what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to record the value of any prize on the lower axis plus a fixed error term. Everybody okay with that? That is stupid. It is stupid because the vast majority of the stuff you're going to encounter is in this range. And so you'd really like to increase your precision here. Stuff out here is drawn with very low probability. So committing precision to the edges is silly. There are lots of beautiful theorems about this that come from information theory, but the basic idea is if I took the cumulative integral of this function, this function, which would be the transform relating the, let's say, the utility, or let's just make it the x value, to the subjective value, would now uniformly distribute the error. It would give me the most precision, the st function steepest, where I most am likely to encounter uh, a choice. So that's a cool idea. Um, what if we assume that precision is costly and that the brain employs some transform which optimally solves this costliness problem? Would that give us a different theory? Now, let me pause. I'm now going to take you to um, a theory paper of ours. But I'd be kind of lying if, if I was a really cool economist, I would have written this theory paper 10 years ago. But I couldn't figure any of this out. And so what we actually did, advantage of because theory, is we did a lot of measurements in the brain to try and actually map this transform. And once we had the transform mapped, its form became obvious. We were like, oh, what a bunch of idiots we've been. OK, so this is a paper uh, of mine with uh, an old postdoc of mine, Kai Steverson, and my colleague and close friend, Adam Brandenberger. And we've, uh, this just came out in GBO uh, about uh, six months ago. And so I'm just going to walk you through the core idea. I'm going to talk about representations at three levels for a moment. I'm going to talk about an information theoretic representation. I'm going to try and maximize information about the choice set. That's going to be my goal. I'm going to ask what information maximizing functions look like. And they're actually going to turn out to be observed neural representational functions. 
And then the last thing I'm going to do is ask, what would that look like projected into choice theory? And you're going to see it's a relaxation of the loose choice law. It's not too far from Conrad and Tversky. OK, so the first idea is really simple. Um, rho here is going to be some choice rule that's going to um, map out a choice probability from a value x drawn from a choice set A. So conditional upon the choice set and the x, I'm going to have some value. Then I'm going to choose that thing. Everybody OK with that? And then I actually have the value of that thing. It's true value to me, pursuit costless, perfect value. And of course, the product of these two, this is just kind of the probability I'll choose it times what it's worth. So this is the expected utility-ish thing of what the value of this is conditional upon facing this noisy choice rule as an inter interpolation. Everybody OK with that? So all we're going to try and do is we're going to ask for any given choice rule, how much does that choice rule increase or decrease the entropy? OK, so this is going to be the informational efficiency of the representation of this choice set A, conditional upon the intrinsic entropy of choice set A. So I'm going to develop this little equation that's going to tell me now, oh, I can figure out what a given choice rule facing a given choice set is doing to the entropy of the choice set's representation. This is actually what I'm losing by having noise. And I can now maximize this function and ask, what's the row that gives me the least possible losses due to noise? OK, so um, in the paper, this is now, I'm now two pages further along. Um, this is what we think of as the marginal improvement. This is the best possible case versus the case we're considering with this choice rule. And so this is the marginal improvement or loss associated with this choice rule. And so what we're going to basically do is say there's some marginal loss. The marginals make it much easier to do some of the math. And uh, we're going to multiply it by our cost function. The f of a is going to be our cost function. Now, in the paper, we're very agnostic about this because Adam and I thought about it. You know, if you make too many restrictions, even if they're justified by data, you look like a schmuck to, uh, that's a New York word, um, to an economist. So we don't really impose many restrictions on F of A, but I'm going to tell you that the cost of precision is monotone and probably linear. And we have really good, we have, we have absolute evidence that it's monotone, and we have very good evidence that it's linear. And that's kind of the story I told you where you add neurons and you add precision. And we have evolutionary data that supports that. We have metabolic data that supports that. We have modeling data that supports that claim. I don't need it, but it is what it is. OK. So now I've got this idea that there's some marginal advantage or loss associated with a representation. I'm going to pick amongst these representations row, and I'm going to pay a price for these representations. Oh. I I'm missing the maximization. Oh, OK, so I'm sorry I'm missing. The, I'm an idiot, and I left out the last slide here. So the last slide is supposed to be the max operator, where we compute, we actually we just look for the row that's going to maximize the, our um, coding efficiency in the face of our constraint. So we're going to use the constraint as a, as a limitation on the maximization procedure. OK, so now I'm jumping to the second layer of the theory quickly. And this is, um, so what would that look like as a functional form? That functional form is really simple. We just take the true value of the prize, and we conditional upon its current noise structure, and we divide out the costs of the representation. And we're going to look for a representation that maximizes Really, it maximizes, I hate to say this, but it maximizes the expected utility of the choices because it's sensitive to the costs. OK, so here's an example of what that function would look like. Um, we're going to draw our row, our mapping function, such that it maximizes that thing I just described. Here's this really cool thing. This particular function that I just uh, put up, the, there, are, there are a thousand, no exaggeration, neurobiology papers that say that neurobiological systems that represent values in the brain, where they are the brightness of lights, the sweetness of sugar, 
or how much you like Kit Kat bars, follow a function having exactly this functional form. That's kind of neat because we, didn't, we don't go in requiring that, but we start with this information problem and what we wind up with is a functional form that has been observed to have first evolved at least a billion years ago and which exists in animals ranging from fruit flies to us. That's cool and not an accident. Now, I'm not gonna say much about this. I mean, the, this paper's published, you can all read it. Um, this is loose choice. It says that the choice ratio, in choice for, if I draw two prizes, X and Y, from choice set A, the ratio by which I choose the two of them is invariant to choice set. On the right, I've just changed the choice set to be choice set B. I've kept X and Y, and their ratio has to be constant. That's the loose choice rule. We know that's violated all the time. That's kind of one of the core features of uh, prospect theory is that that gets violated all the time. In fact, um, those of you who do this for a living know that um, uh, random utility theory does also violate the loose choice rule. It violates it, interestingly, in a very different way because it obeys what's called the axiom of regularity. Interestingly, um, kahneman Tversky stuff violates regularity, and this puppy does too, in an interesting way that I love to talk about, but I want to keep going. Because as Diego kept pointing out, I'm keeping you from some other talk. <laughs> no, I'm not keeping you from another talk. Okay, so here's, the, here's this paper, which I'm sort of waving my hands at, um, that I used to give a couple of years ago. Um, we show that there are three equivalent representations that um, the one in the middle is the standard neurobiological representation of subjective value. It is the understood subjective value transform function. The one above it, it is perfectly equivalent to, which is the optimal trade-off of the cost of precision against the costs of not having precision, utility maximization. And the bottom one is this choice rule characterization of the story I just told you, um, which is going to be an interesting area that we're really digging on right now, that a lot of the kahneman Tversky prospect theoretic style stuff actually drops out of this analysis as well. Now, um, I told you that really what happened is we got to this um, theory paper backwards. What we did first was spend 10 years trying to understand what this, why this function was there and exactly what it looked like. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. And published a pile of papers about it in humans and in animals. And I've been doing choice theoretic studies in humans and animals for 20 years. And all of them actually point at this bottom line. And I think the real challenge for us was understanding the top line, which is, I think, the effort to reconcile it with what Freeman would have called a clean theory. Maybe not uh, his taste, but I think it would have met that rule. OK, so to give you just a flavor of this, I'm going to talk through a couple of these papers to give you a sense of what all of this huge literature looks like. These are not all from my group. We're going to take a look at this lower level first. And I'm going to now do something totally wacky and which I know is not comfortable. Um, I'm going to turn totally to the neurobiology. I'm going to look at a standard neurobiological model of how neurons in the brain take an input x and generate an output uh, subjective value of x. And you know, we've studied that for 20 years. This is what a neurobiological model of that type looks like. <clears throat> These are neurons. They're stylized elements. Got it, 15, no problem. I will bring the train into the station on time. Um, these are stylized elements, and what they do is they have put out a, a number that ranges from, they actually put out a real number. They have natural units of action potentials per second. They range from 0 to 100 for biophysical purposes. The way we think about them is they produce an output which maps to R++, or sorry, to R+, um, that is bounded. And remember, they have finite noise, so the bounding is important. These guys receive inputs. These inputs, for our purposes right now, let's think of them as the true value of the prize is x in the outside world. Each one of these guys is trying to send out the true value of x. That's easy. That's the numerator in the function I was showing you before. But now I have to embed the cost function, right? I have to 
another way to say embedding the cost function is I have to maximize the entropy of the output distribution. And the way I have to do that is I have to suck out all the shared information in the choice set so that what comes out is just the entropy maximized version. I have to take the integral of that Gaussian distribution. And the way neurons are known to do this is <clears throat> these outputs, these uh, R plus outputs from each of the neurons which represents an input value, a member of the current choice set, are aggregated. And this little neuron actually just computes division. So this is the numerator and this is literally the denominator. Now the network has some internal structure and inertia, which I'm talking about in a second. And that produces a constant in there, which turns out to be really interesting, which I'll talk about in a second. What's nice about these models is, of course, as a computational neuroscientist, we write them out as families of coupled nonlinear differential equations, blah, blah, blah. These are the whatever. And that allows us to do analyses that, that are really probably more familiar to operations researchers, where we can ask, for example, where are the unique equilibrium states for these uh, networks of neurons? Where do they come to an equilibrium? What do they represent at equilibrium? Here's an interesting fact. That standard network at equilibrium represents that function I was just talking about. Everybody okay with that? With one additional feature, the top, this is invisible in this little pointer, the top is the input value, the bottom is all the other neurons, and there's a constant in here. Um, this constant actually turns out to be the reference point, the physical instantiation of the reference point. Uh, oh, that's what I just said. So that's what I, I should have put that up before I said it. And um, this little constant here, the reference point is a time-weighted average of the recently encountered elements in choice sets I've seen in the recent past. It's the simplest possible discounted model of that. And by the way, there are a pile of neurobiological papers and neurons which have been showed to compute exactly that function. It's probably not the right one at the end of the day, but it's a good starting place. Okay, so that was like sort of like hand wavy pointing at the fact that um, I'm pointing back at this argument that when we do because economics, we get advantages. I could not for the life of me have done, done the theory paper I just showed you if I hadn't gone through the 10 papers that led through what is the transform physically being used in the brain. How does that transform work? What does it look like? Please place some restrictions on the functional forms I'm allowed to think about. And with those restrictions in place, it became clear that what the system was doing was something theoretically interesting. Now, okay, so now let me be a real pain in the neck, um, reveal a preference economist, which many days I wake up and am, and say, Paul, that's very interesting. I could not care less, um, because what I care about is human choice behavior. You showed me some cool things about neurons, some things about brain scans. You presented an alternative version of expected utility theory, blah, blah, blah. Does any of this have any bite for me, a real economist? And I mean, at the end of the day, that's all I care about, too. So here's the question. Do these theories have bite for economists? So let's, let's, let's look at, there are a dozen papers about this, but let's look at a really simple one that I love. This is a, this is a really neat thing. In a traditional model, let's imagine I had, a, I had three prizes, which are gonna be drawn from these three Gaussians. Everybody okay with this idea? And so I'm just gonna have to choose A, B, or C, where A is drawn from this distribution, B from this, and C from this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do four treatments. In treatment A, treatment one, there's going to be no third option. This guy should be C because he's the lowest valued option. In this condition, C is going to be really low valued. In this condition, C is going to be worth a little bit more. In this condition, C is going to be worth a little bit more. To a traditional economist, so what? It should have no impact on choice probabilities. Everybody okay? Relative choice probabilities between these two. No reason it should. But think about it from an information maximizing point of view. From an information maximizing point of view, the entropy of the choice set is changing. This choice set is really clustered. And so you could recode it just in this range. These are range normalization models, right? Which are very cool right now and having a good heyday right now. Um, so you'd recode this by changing the range. And you would change it in a very specific way. 
and it would improve choice efficiency in the face of constant uh, noise. But what would you see, forget constant noise, if you were looking at the choice output? Well, this class of model would say that the relative choices between these two, A and B, were unaffected by the value or presence of C. The normalization models don't predict that. They actually predict that as C comes up and the entropy of the choice set is changing, what's actually happening is the choice problem is getting harder. And the prediction is that the system does the best it can, given its fixed precision, and because the denominator is growing, the representation of these two gets pushed over to the left. And the result is the choice is harder and you make more errors, and the relative choice efficiency between these two changes. Conditional choice probabilities depend. So the first time we did that, we did that in monkeys. I'm not going to show it to you. It was so startling and so clear that people said, well, that just proves monkeys are dumb. Um, so of course, we immediately did it in humans. The human version of that experiment is really simple. We're going to take 60 snack food, 40 snack foods. We're going to fast a bunch of NYU undergraduates. I'm trying to make this sound like a real economics experiment. Um, it's all incentive compatible. They're going to BDM bid twice on each of the snack foods, so can I, I can establish some estimate both of their stochasticity or my measurement precision, and so I can get an estimate of what the values of each of these goods are. That's going to allow me to construct triplets. I'm actually going to construct a unique triplet every time I show it to my subject. I can construct hundreds of triplets, an A and a B option, and a C option, and I'm just going to use the model to ask what, what's going on. Um, oop, ah, another missing slide. Well, you'll have to go read this paper, which is in PNAS. Um, the answer is that um, we see exactly what we saw in the monkeys, which is that choice stochasticity between the two high-ranking elements depends on the value of the low-ranking element, even when it is never, ever chosen. Everybody get this idea? As the low-valued option goes into the choice set, even when the probability of choice between A and B is fully inclusive, the, their choice ratio depends on the value of C. The higher the value of C, the more you approximate perfect stochasticity. This is easy, this is, um, this is I'm kind of confused, but this is the information theoretic foundation for it. This is another example of this. This is from Kenway's work. Uh, There's another PNS paper of Kenway and mine. Uh, here, and I'm, I know I'm really getting close on time. What do I got, like five, okay. Here we do the curse of choice, same story, okay. Um, as we increase the number of choice elements, we can predict the fall off in choice efficiency. Not only that, we can predict not just the fall off in choice efficiency, but how likely you are to pick the best option, the second best option, the third best option, the fourth best option, based on their BDM bids and what the current choice set is. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So here is, uh, I'm going to tell me what you like from amongst this choice set of two or amongst this choice set of 12. And this is a paper of Ryan Webb's um, that just came out in Management Science. Uh, and so here what I'm plotting on the top left is the probability you'll get the item that I know to be your first choice based on all your pre previous BDM bids as a function of choice set size. In red is the data. So as choice sets grow, the likelihood I'll get it falls off by about 20%. The next one is the probability I'll pick the second ranked item as a function of choice set size. Third ranked item. Nth ranked item. The uh, green is the best fit multinomial uh, load chip with two parameters. Absolutely standard way to fit this, but you have to fit all the data with two parameters. And in blue is the neurally and information theoretically derived function with two parameters. So, I mean, there's kind of no doubt about which one is performing better. So that's a, an important lesson. This thing outper outperforms multinomial probits hugely, which means, to say that in another way, it's outperforming random utility theory. Uh, the, I'm not going to do this. This is, would be hopeless. Uh, I'm just going to say that um, I'll give you a soupçon of this. This is a, a, this is a paper. This is the paper I really wanted to talk about. This is current work by me uh, and Agnieszka Tamula at the University of Sydney. And Agnieszka and I have been analyzing 
these transforms that we've observed in the brain that obey these information theoretic properties and thinking about what their functional forms are and what they mean with regard to risk attitude, loss aversion, risk seeking, blah, 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 and asking whether they can outperform prospect theory when, we're, when we take them to real data. Um, this is actually what, I hate to use this word, what the value function looks like in subjective expected utility theory. Um, it has one free parameter, which is this exponent. Um, I can talk about what we think that means. We think it's about the choice set size, and, and we can show that it's an optimal solution to a choice set size problem. Here is when you have alpha uh, one, and here's what happens as alpha grows. The thing I want you to notice is that the family of value functions that you see here, they're not really value functions, range from something that looks like Bernoulli's value function in blue, all the way to something that looks dead on like a prospect theory function in red. The theory also has this embedded term which we got out of the networks, which is the a reference point. We actually think we have a really good biological understanding of the sources of the reference point. And we also know from an information theoretic point, point of view that we have to have some, ref, some reference point there. It, basically what it does is it allows us to center the distribution. And as we increase the reference point, the distribution shifts to the right. This should remind everybody of Kosecki Rabin. But not exactly, because remember, Kosecki Rabin does not preserve diminishing marginal utility. That's the big thing it gave up. This thing shifts to the right, but it preserves diminishing marginal utility, which probably has something to do with Gumbel distributions that we're working on now. Um, this is if you actually compute loss aversion. If you actually use the model and ask what's loss aversion look like, the model produces something that looks like loss aversion. This is really weird. Um, if you use it as a generative model to produce imaginary choosers. And then you take the choices of those imaginary choosers and you push them through standard prospect theory. It gives you probability weighting functions. This is a really weird fact. I mean, I have a deep understanding for this because I've worked on it for so long. Let me say that a slightly different way. Everybody knows that in prospect theory risk, your risk attitude emerges from a lot of parameters which are all collinear. Curvature of the upgoing utility function, curvature of the downgoing utility function, the loss aversion parameter, and the two parameters for the probability weighting function. These, op these informationally efficient functions produce weird, re weird slightly weird uh, risk attitudes, but they do it without using any probability weighting function. They, are, they treat probability as, as independence axiom obeying. But when we take their output and we push it through prospect theory, we get out these probability weighting functions. And so that you know, raises, I think, an interesting question. All right, I'm finishing up. OK. Um, so we started with this story. If Milton Friedman had been a neuroeconomist, he would have said, this is the fundamental theorem of choice. Somewhere in the brain, Here's a utility representation. There are, it probably receives inputs from brain areas, which represent separate specific things. I mean, I believe that's true. And I believe we can look for them. And there are lots of good papers about that, where you find different attributes coded in different places that all aggregate across a preference function. No doubt about that. But somewhere they aggregate. And we know exactly where that is. We can measure it. We can predict choice. This works great. There's just no, no slop left in that representation. But the problem is that our neuroeconomic choosers, just like everybody else choosers, they don't, they don't obey this function. They, they're weird. They violate rationality all the time. So I want to raise this interesting possibility, which I think, you know, for me, this, I started out looking for the rabbit and the, um, and the tortoise. But that's not where I've ended up. Where I've ended up is arguing that this really ought to be the kind of thing we should be looking for as behavioral economists. A sharp, clean theory that meets Friedman's dicta of what is a sharp theory, but which can really account for all of these weird behaviors that we see in a really compact way. Now, I don't really think, OK, so now let me calm down um, and say, I don't really think this is the fundamental theorem of choice. Of course it's wrong. But what I'm trying to convince you of is that um, taking the neuro seriously will get us closer to the true theorem 
than just ignoring it or just saying, whatever, brain areas, brain areas, brain areas. I mean, there is deep theory to be done on the deep empirical data that we have. And if we assume that we make choices because our brains make choices for us, and if we assume that we can go look at those choice mechanisms, they may give us fundamental insights that save us a lot of time in getting to these more sophisticated functional forms. Okay, uh, blah, 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 I said that, blah, 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 I said that. Okay, so here's where I'm leaving. What would Uncle Milton say? Uncle Milton would say, you are a bad man. Um, it is true, Paul, that your theory is moderately simple, and it's clear that it's been fruitful, but you obsess about um, all this other stuff that we should just ignore. Okay, so here's my answer to Uncle Milton. Um, I think this is, uh, this is Herb Simon, of course. I searched and searched to find a good picture of Herb Simon laughing because he did not do that very much. Um, I think, you know, really what I'm arguing for is something that Simon waved his hands about to us as economists. I mean, Simon was both a blessing and a curse to economics. The blessing was, he said, there are limits in the computational machinery. But I think what a lot of us heard were, so it sucks. And that was the wrong message. The question is, what are those limits? They're costs. If we took our own program seriously, we would treat those costs seriously. And we would tell neurobiologists, you can use our machinery to figure out what your representation is. There are a bunch of labs that are doing that. I really encourage you to follow this literature. I think that you know, in the next 10 years, you're gonna see more and more of these reduced form models percolating up into the mainstream economics literature. And I, I just, I urge you all not to be credulous in your reading of this literature. Don't believe everything you read. Don't believe me. Go read some of these papers. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Two minutes left. It's really weird, right? Uh, I, that paper has been in review for five years. The talk that it's costly to make these computations and that it would lead me to overweigh low probability events. If anything, I think that yeah. costly decision making would cause me to underweigh low probability events. But I don't understand the, like, what is it that causes you? That's exactly the opposite of what I would have expected based on, on what he's told. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And, um, so Agnieszka, my paper, has struggled with this problem, which is um, I can demonstrate it numerically really, really clearly, but the problem is I'm trying to... Andre said to me, when you can explain this, uh, the Andre Schleifer said to me, you, when you can explain this, I'll publish this in QJ. That's like not something you can take to the bank, of course, but um, we're mapping from a two-parameter function into a five to seven-parameter function, so there's no unique mapping. And I have done the partial differentials to like and blue, there's so many possible explanations that I struggle with them. Um, I can give you an intuition, but I just don't think there's gonna be a very elegant closed form solution. The intuition is, in, um, in Kahneman and Tversky, your risk attitude comes from the curvature of this function, and that's it. There are reference points, but reference points can't influence risk attitude. If you are Bill Gates, or you are a graduate student, your reference point doesn't influence your risk attitude. So that's a kind of weird and interesting feature. Probability weighting adds more complexity to the representation. Now, the, the thing is, this theory doesn't actually, I mean, this is an ugly feature of it. There are no preferences in this theory. Preferences emerge from the interaction of these two functions. This function, which is this exponential function, the way you should think about this mathematically is what it's doing is it's tuning. If you thought about the function I showed you where there was like a little Gaussian and I took its cumulative integral, if you push this backwards and ask what's the, what's the distribution it's representing, 
This actually has to do with the tail structure of the distribution for optimal representation. So the tailiness of the representation controls risk attitude. The tailiness of the distribution of the choice sets controls risk attitude. And so does the reference point. Now there are probably some embedded assumptions here that we don't totally understand, but this makes it really different because, I mean, in Kahneman and Traversky, there is a preference function and then there's a utility, there's a probability weighting function added to it, which gives you the fourfold pattern, right? That's the critical idea. And here, we're kind of faking it. I mean, maybe not. It's a, it is emerging from this information maximization procedure with two non-orthogonal functions. That's the really bad feature about this. These functions, we have not yet figured out how to orthogonalize them. There's gonna be a space where they are orthogonal, and then I'll answer your question better. But right now, because these two functions are collinear in preference space, I don't give you a really great answer. But empirically, I'm absolutely 100% sure of it. We can really recover uh, probability weighting functions if I use this as a generative chooser and use like the Wu and Gonzalez choice set. Now, Agnieszka and I are right now running an MTurk experiment. This is kind of the endless effort to get this paper published with 500 choosers and ranges of reference points, and we're really trying to demonstrate the robustness of what I just told you in a big, big choice set where people are choosing over hundreds and hundreds of dollars. So we're spending $50,000 to generate this choice set in the hope that uh, it, will, it will be the answer I need to give you that I don't have. So I agree with that. Okay, so then my question but, is... But like who in this room except me cares about modeling brain processes? Well, you're, you're telling us that we have something to gain from it. I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that... I'm arguing that... Let, let me say it a slightly different way. For the first 10 years, when we were trying to find the utility representation in the brain, people would say, how does it matter to me? Uh, right? Doug Bernheim used to always say to me, Paul, why should I care? He said, it's like it's an interesting cocktail party discussion. But it just has no, it just doesn't matter to me because I only care about what people choose. And you're using what people choose to explain the underlying brain structure. That's interesting to biologists, but not to me. Are you showing him the, the brain model being the So uh, Doug said to me, okay, so what you've proven to me is that by using the brain data, you have uh, saved some time. And I said, what do you mean by that? Like, I didn't even get it. He said, well, you know, by gradient descent, we'd have got there. You just kind of saved us some time getting there because you used, Farouk Gull sometimes calls this Paul's inspiration, but which I think he means the brain. Um, okay, so, okay. And that's kind of what my question is about. Okay, if we want to take the shortcut to having a better understanding of, of choice and behaviors of economists and, and maybe follow some of the, the, the path that you're leading us on, um, data informs modeling. Where's, um, where are the best marginal gains? Like, should we be pointing our attention into taking vast amounts of data that we already have and trying to uh, build models on it? Or is the data lacking? We have some models, but we need to be gathering more data. And with like, technolo technological improvements in, in brain science, like the next best thing after fMRI, would that be helping us take the yeah, see, I leap? Here's an example story of doing that. The models we wrote out <clears throat> have this um, time-weighted average that I mentioned, where they compute the reference point based on some recent history. And I now have very precise predictions about how changing the reference point changes choice. 
So we did an experiment. This is a straight up new behavioral experiment. I just took the theory and I said, okay, if that's my theory of choice, can I design an experiment to test that theory of choice? And the answer is really simple. What we did was we did one of these BDM Rangel style bidding experiments. We get 30 candy bars and then we have you tell me how much you're gonna pay for each of the candy bars. And then we adapt you by showing you only high value candy bars for a little while, 10 minutes. And then we ask you to rebid out the set and then low value candy bars and ask you to rebid out the set. And what's interesting is um, if I give you high value candy bars exactly as predicted by the neuro theory, people then underbid on low value candy bars. The underbids relax with a perfectly exponential time series over the course of, of about seven minutes. So the only thing that I didn't know from the neural data was the time constant. Actually, we had a good guess of it from one particular measurement. So that's an example where we took the neurobiological theory and just use it as economists. And here was this weird contextual behavior that nobody had ever posited the existence of. 